Welcome everyone to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Thank you for being here this morning for our program, How Do You Mosaic with Jenny Kirby. Uh, this program is inspired by our special exhibition that's on view on level two adjacent to our East Asian and Ancient Art Galleries. It's a long one, so pardon me. Uh, a return to the Grand Tour Micro Mosaic Jewels from the collection of Elizabeth Locke. It is on view until September 2nd, so you have this month to go see it. It is not ticketed. You're welcome to just walk on up there after this and take a look. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny. Great. Thank you, Lizzie. Okay. Thank you all for coming. This is my passion. Most of you all know that probably my second passion, I'll call it, is Crossroads Art Center being the owner of that and starting that with James 17 years ago. Um, but it all started because I was doing mosaics down at the Shaco Bottom Art Center. And when Shaco Bottom moved to Petersburg, we decided to create our own art center here. So James and I did that, and that's been going for 17 years now. But this is my true passion. So I want to thank Izzy for um, making that introduction. I want to thank the VMFA for having me here. And um, Mary Holland, who heads up their educational department, I want to thank her for suggesting, I say turning in me, <laughs> to, to do the lecture. That was fun. I used to teach uh, at the VMFA and the Visual Arts Center, University of Richmond, and Jason Sargent, John Tyler, everywhere. I taught all the mosaics classes for, for years before the Art Center. and. Um, I'm just excited to be here. So I want to find out how many people have actually gone upstairs to see the Elizabeth Locke exhibit already. Good. You guys have done your pre-work. I love that. So we're going to talk about that uh, first. That's going to be our first topic. And we're going to actually show you in a video how that actually is made, produced. We can't do that live because it involves a blowtorch and melting glass and a few other things that they don't want us to do in the, in the BMFA. But the first thing I want to do is give you just a perspective and a history on mosaics, just so you know how old and how long this form of art has, has happened. Think about 3000 BC. That's the early Middle Bronze Age. That is so long ago. And that is the first mosaic that they have found in a temple in Mesopotamia, which is basically Iran, Iraq, Syria currently. And the first mosaic was made out of colored stones, shells, and ivory. So things that they could just collect and create something out of. So that was 3000 BC. Come forward to 2000 BC and you actually start to get, whoop, there we go. You actually start to get mosaics that are made out of cones. They literally made these cones. This is not one of these cones, but <laughs> they made these cones. Um, and they pushed the pointed side in. So you see the round side. So when they were making the columns, they pushed them in to make the round side. And that was at about 2000 BC. So skip ahead to 1500 BC. That's when they actually first started doing glazed tiles. So how many people have taken a pottery class? Okay. So glazing is what you do after you fired it and have this. So glazing puts this protective layer on it, gives it color, so you could start to add different colors into your mosaics because they were adding it to the glaze. And then, in ABC, you had pebble pavements, and those were just different color stones. There weren't a whole lot of patterns to them, but that was just what you started to see in the Greeks and the Romans, they were doing the, the pebbles pathways. Then in the fourth century BC, the Greeks really took that pebble and turned it into an art form. Um, they started doing precise geometric patterns. They started doing scenes with people in them, animals in them. And if you have not been to the Pompeii exhibit at the Science Museum, you should go. Because not just for the mosaics that you get to see that are there, but also for the Pompeii story. But those are some of the most well-preserved because they were buried at ash. Uh, that you will see that date back that far. 
So, get to the second century BC. That's when they truly started manufacturing mosaic Teresa, which is sort of the catch-all for what we use in our bits and pieces and parts. And they started making them in literally millimeter forms, very, very tiny, tiny, tiny pieces. And that's what you're gonna see or have seen upstairs with Elizabeth Law. So once the Roman Empire got its hands on everything and started spreading across the world, that's literally how mosaics spread. They took artisans with them, they took builders with them, and that's how mosaics ended up everywhere, all in England, all the way up in Norway, everywhere you can think of. So I know you guys did not come from a history lesson. You actually want to see what I create and how I create it and, and what goes on. So I'm gonna talk about four different techniques. The micro mosaic jewelry, Elizabeth Block upstairs, the micro mosaic ancient method of creating a double reverse method, which is this guy and actually that guy, and then a direct method, and we're gonna talk about stepping stones, and I'm actually gonna demonstrate a stepping stone. So, since I can't use fire, we're gonna do the video next. Get that heat off, maybe. There we go. So this, this, this video is from the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Art Music Factory produced this. So this is going to give you literally getting the end soup to nuts on how they create these teeny weeny micro mosaics. And at the end of all of this, I do have the pieces of glass that you can see and how tiny they, they really are that they're using. So go ahead, Izzy, cue it up. They're melting the glass and they're going to make it into a ball, almost very similar to what you do when you blow glass. And they're pulling the glass, they're stretching it out. And once you stretch it out, it, it will pull pretty quickly. And that is a little cutter that they are using to be able to cut the tiles or to cut the glass. And it's just these little ribbons. This is a paste, and I have some samples of the paste that they are pushing into the container that they're going to make this micro mosaic in. And now she's color matching with the design. You can see she has a pattern that she's working with, and she's color matching each piece to figure out what color is going to work where. And gently sliding them in with the tweezers. The tweezers are key. And you can see how exacting they actually get to the piece. It's just amazing. She's following it a little bit so it fits in place. Heating some more up, creating more colors. And the color is never gonna be the same every time. So truly custom colors. like pull and taffy, just a little different. And they do use special glasses when they're creating these. You have to. She 
She's using a block just to push everything in, make sure everything is level. And this is wax that she's heating, that she's gonna pour over the surface, and that helps seal the tile and fill in if there are any gaps whatsoever, which I doubt there are. And then she's scraping off the excess, she's sanding it down. She's touching up where she's probably sanded too much or not enough or needed to make it more level. And she takes a finer and finer sandpaper every time. And that's an abrasive polish just to finish it off. And literally she's rinsing it off with water. And then she puts the final layer of wax on. It's pretty incredible. So who's ready to do that? Let's do it right now. Let's do it. <laughs> so, talking about the glasses, if you um, have a chance to go to Florence, there is a micro mosaics or mosaic studio museum there. Make sure that you check out what they've got. They also have upstairs all the equipment that had been used forever, the desks that these people used to sit at. Um, literally back in the Vatican, it started in the 15th century. Um, making these mosaics, bringing this craft to light. And apparently these folks that were making the mosaics could only work on them for about three or four or five years at the most and then they would be blind. That was it. They, they couldn't, they, you, you're having such detailed work that um, you, you couldn't see it after a while. So that's micro mosaics. So let's talk about the ancient method of making these guys. So this is the piece that I made, this is the finished piece obviously, um, in Ravenna. So I, along with my girlfriend Vivian, went to Ravenna, and Vivian had never taken a mosaics class in her life. She's a very good artist, amazing artist, but never taken a mosaics class. So I threw her into the fire, and she came with me. And um, we, so classes you can take, even this difficult, can also be for beginners as well you have an eye. So this is the finished piece. This is also the finished piece live. And what I started out with is a piece of clay. That's clay sitting right there, just wet clay. And you can see above it was the picture that I decided, and of course I knew I wasn't going to be able to do everything, so I just picked the snake in the tree. And there's a, a, a paper, it's a transfer paper that you can use to transfer onto pottery. And I traced out the design, and you can see at the top all the little teeny little mosaics that are part of that picture. And I traced all of those out. I didn't have to trace the background. The background, I just needed to do the lines. But all of those little squares are supposed to be pieces of tile. So you do this, you pull out the piece, you start to pick then the pieces of tile. There we go. You start to pick the pieces of tile that you're going to to use. And then the way you cut those, because these are actually stones, some of these are marble, some of them are precious stones. So you have to figure out how you're going to cut them. And you use a hardy and a hammer, which is what we have here. So I'm going to grab this. Come on, Izzy, come on over. Um, the hardy and the hammer. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we can try the camera. We'll see what happens. A hardy and a hammer, you have two sides to a hardy and a hammer. One is for glass, and one is for natural stones, and marble, and all of that. And these are called small, teeny weeny itsy bitsy pieces. So my band on here. <laughs> there we go. So, there we go, right there? Okay, so that's a little piece of tile. You can see where I chopped a couple earlier today. And you have to let the hammer do the work. You can't just manhandle it. So you put it on the middle, and then you chop it. And then you can just keep going down. And that, 
this is not from me doing this. This was from me from setting up an easel. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just keep going smaller and smaller and smaller usually. There we go. And that's, you keep going down until you get those teeny weeny small pieces. So it's all in, and this is very sharp, so it's all, and this is very sharp, it all and how you hit it just straight on to get those cues. And it does take practice. Thank you. So the first time that I did this was in Rome. I went to take a class with Enzo who repairs the mosaics that are in all the Roman museums. He studied at the Vatican, and he was having a class. And I'm like, that's who I want to go learn to take the class from. And that's when I created this piece. This piece is a lot bigger, much, much larger pieces. So I look at this as my test piece of really learning how to do this. Because I had to cut them, but I didn't have to cut them that small. And then in Ravenna, this is the piece. And I'm going to, I think you can sort of see how small it is. I'm going to put it under here. And that will give you an idea of the size of these pieces, of how tiny they are. And feel free to come up later and look at them. And then the way you want to lay this out, I think this is at the right angle? Yeah. So the way you lay one of these mosaics out, you actually start with the snake. Yeah, we'll, go yeah, we'll go back to the, yeah. Click back. There we go. There we go. So you can tell where I started with the snake, cutting the pieces and putting them in place. And you continue on. So you're following the contour of the snake. And then once you get to the snake, you start with the outline. And as you can tell, I'm following the outline with what's going to be the background material. So you're just contouring, and that actually, by contouring, makes that snake and the tree stand out. If I just ran it straight across, it wouldn't have as much impact. But by going around and contouring around, especially the snake and the tree, that makes that the more important piece. And then you go in and you cut the background, and you try to keep them in rows, <laughs> uh, going across. So all that is stuffed into the clay, and you try to cut them all the same size, so they're all the same level that's stuffed into the clay, and you try to keep the same, same um, depth. Try, try is the question. So the next step, there we go. So the next step is mixing some really smelly glue. They used, when we were taking class, it's actually rabbit glue. And I can't do that. So I use flower glue. It literally is flour and water mixed together. So you take the flour and the water, and you take cheesecloth. And that's what you see being the cheesecloth is the white. You put the cheesecloth over top of the piece. And what you're doing is you're gluing the cheesecloth to the top of the piece with the glue. Then you're going to flip it over. And then you have to remove all the pottery, all the clay. And the clay. You usually let this sit for at least 12 hours before you start to remove it because you want the clay to dry. Apparently, I had a lot of clay <laughs> that was stuck in all kinds of places in these. So when you turn it over, it should just peel right off, but it doesn't. So we were using all kinds of dental tools <laughs> to pick out the pieces, and and so that's where these little guys sort of come in handy. And it's so glued to the cheesecloth, you can actually pull the mosaic so it opens up. So if you were looking at it from the backside, just like this, you can turn it 
flip it like this so lots of things come out and you can just dig right in and pull the rest of the clay out. So once you get the clay out, it sort of looks like this. It almost looks like if you're in an airplane and you're looking down on the landscape because obviously all of mine were not level. So once you do that, then you're ready to prepare the tray. And that's what this is. This is the tray. And I'm using thin set. And thin set is just an additive. I don't think I have any thin set out here. Thin set is a, is, is a, a, a glue that I usually use when I'm working on things that may get wet, but it's also the closest that we have to what they used way back when with the ancient method. So you put that all over the tray, in a, in a, not a thick layer, but a good sized layer. And then you also, what we call butter back, the entire back of the piece. And then you put it into the tray. And you want to let it sit just a little bit. You'll see that the, the um, thin set's not coming all the way up and around. You've got some room between that and the tops of the tiles where the cheesecloth is. So, how do you get the cheesecloth off? Take some really hot water, whoop, take some really hot water, and you put a sponge, and you just start wiping and wiping and wiping um, the hot water onto the cheesecloth. And then eventually, it'll start to loosen, because the flour glue loosens up with hot water. And then you end up with this guy. In the back of the, um, this part, is a combination, I call it a cement slurry, because they ground up all the leftover stones, and they grind up all the leftover marble into just tiny, tiny little flakes. And you can see that in here a little closer up after um, the lecture's over. And then you literally just pour it around and tuck it in. And within an hour, you could hose it off. There's, it's not going to go anywhere. It's, it, it goes and seals that fast. It's, it's quite amazing. So that is doing micro mosaics, not as micro as the jewelry, and not as crazy as the jewelry, but it's still crazy. <laughs> and this, I know, is not something that you're going to say, wow, let's go do that right now. I know this is exactly what I'm going to do, and I'm going to try to cut my finger off with that thing, too. So I'm going to show you something that you can actually do. Um, you could actually do this. You truly could. But something that's a little easier. Let's talk about stepping stones. So with stepping stones, you can go buy one from Home Depot Lowe's, already made. You can do the direct method, which is basically just picking out your pattern, figuring out what you want to do. You could use these fun little things to actually put on the stepping stone and trace it out and use it. You can use butterflies, all kinds of things that you want to do. And then you cut the tiles to go into the piece. You glue them on, and then you would grout it. The other method, and I'm going to show you guys how to cut and everything in a few minutes. The other method is taking the cement, which I've already poured into that bowl, and having a form, and that's a plastic form, which is great, because the plastic just releases pretty quickly. And this is, this is actually, a, let's see, this is the bottom one, is after we've poured the stepping stone, cement in, and we've pushed the tiles in. So that's the second way you can do it. The third way you can do it, and I'll show you more about this in a minute, is with common. So this is actually already put together. So let's talk about first, let's see, there's Con. So what I did is I found a picture of a Siberian Husky. I used to have one, about that booker. And you take some contact paper. So contact paper is just sticky on one side and not on the other. And then I taped it down with the sticky side up. And then I started cutting the tiles because I knew he's black and white. I wanted to make him black and white. And I've put these down. So when you press these in, this is actually the top. Because you're going to pour the concrete over into this. And you're going to let it sit for about a week. 
and then you're going to flip it out, and then you're going to clean it off. So the, the, this is really going to be the front, and this will really be the bottom once it's all said and done. So you'll have him like that. So that's, you know, that's something that's easy. That's not, it's not, that, not that difficult. I think I want to go back a slide. Yep. So this, and I'm going to grab you on this one. So I'm going to actually show you how, because I think we've got a few minutes to do this, to mix this up and make this happen. So this is the tile that I've laid out with some idea of how I want to do this. This is the mix that I have created. I'm going to let you run the, yeah, actually, yeah, we can do that, maybe slide it over, or I can do this. Here, that makes it easier. So this is just the cement mints that you would get in that little packet, and you are going to pour some water in it, and it's going to vary every single time you mix this. And the reason why it's going to vary is because of the humidity. Now, if we are in a museum, which I assume is very controlled. I'm going to put this mask on. And you're not going to be here with the mask on. You should wear a mask when you do this. Let's put it that way. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> um, so you usually are going to wear a mask when you do this, especially after the first purpose of mixing it. And you're going to make sure that you get everything up from the bottom. This literally is cement. You were literally making cement. So how many people out there have made a mosaic stepping stone before? I know Mary has. I know some of you guys have. Good deal. Good deal. So, and speaking of, I am not the person to take the class from if you are trying to learn how to um, cut stained glass. That one right there is probably a good one. Are you teaching anymore? I thought so. <laughs> Mary's a good person. And I think we also have some other folks that are teaching. Yeah, for the VMFA. All right. Oh, a little bit more. And this is this is a good workout. There is no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I use the stainless steel one, so it's a little bit easier to clean, but I take it out back. Do not put this down your sink. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, don't even try to rinse. I take it outside and I rinse it out um, with a hose. At the art center, as Adele knows, she's watched me teach class. I actually um, have a slurry in the back of the art center where I dump everything that I create with my grout with this concrete. So, it's like making mud pies, but we're in our 50s. <laughs> so, you need to do what I refer to, and that, now you can tell why I got the apron on. This is, it'd be all over that white shirt. So you just sort of shimmy it, shimmy it. You're getting the, um, all the bubbles to come out. And you can sort of maybe see them come to the surface a little bit. I'll go ahead and put this guy together. I am cheating like there's no tomorrow if I'm using this, but sorry. So we're gonna put this really lovely, big Turkish tile right here in the middle. And I'm just reaming it back and forth a little bit to get it to settle in. I want it to be even. And then I'm just going to take these and place them all the way around. The key to this is having your pattern set and ready to go. You, it, you have probably a good 15 minutes to work with it. But the more you have prepped, the better off you'll be. And these tiles are natural, which means they're porous. So I've mixed this a little wetter than I normally would because these tiles are going to soak up some of this water. And once they soak up the water, did we do something? Tristan? Okay. 
So once you soak up the water, my vanna. <laughs> Better, worse, different. All right, I'm Kizona. So I'm just these these are heavy, believe it or not, compared to other things like glass. So we are just putting these all the way in place, all the way around. And I always end up with one more than I ever thought I needed. And they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to have the same distance between them. You can do whatever you want. Um, and then you can just go back in. You can plop some of these guys. These are just little glass tiles. Easy enough. All the way around. You have to keep in mind, too, when you're doing a stepping stone, if you're using anything that um, is sharp, you want to make sure, like this piece of glass, that you've got it sort of embedded so it's not going to hurt anybody. And this could be decorative. This could be a great doorstop. This could be a stepping stone if you wanted it to be. It could be the world's largest trivet. <laughs> Gosh, no, you're not going to be able to hurt it after it's done. And I just think these are lovely. They're just fun. So you can make it as simple as you want, or you can actually make it as complicated as you want. And we're going with simple right now. So I need to cut a few more of these pieces of glass. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So this is a glass cutter. That's what this is, and it's, it's only meant to cut glass. You really you cannot cut stone with it. You can cut really nice china with it. Um, that's another good thing that you can do with it. And as you see, it just cuts right through. And I'm just nipping it down to something that I want to use. Let me just throw that one in there. Cut it again. Throw that one in there. And as you notice, I'm actually sitting right on top of the tile. I'm not going back. I find that works a lot better. You can when you want to shave some stuff. You can actually even angle. So you can get pretty good about being able to make odd little shapes out of things. It just takes practice. The other thing that I'm going to show you too, we're not going to use it yet, this is a ceramic tile on how you cut ceramic tiles. You can smash this with a hammer. I recommend putting it under a piece of cloth with another piece of cloth on top, putting it this way. You can smash it that way. or you can nip it, and you've got to get the right, ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> there we go. So I'm actually taking it, and I'm not, I'm using this, I'm not doing this, I'm doing this, and leaving some room, and that makes it much easier to be able to cut down. So that gives you an idea. Got about 10 more minutes. Yay, team. Okay, let's see what else we want to talk through. So we can go back to that guy, Izzy. Thank you. And I have all different types of glues and things like that we're going to talk about. I think we'll be able to get to it all. So, over here. Okay, perfect. Maybe. There we go. Glues. The world is your oyster. There's so many different blues. Um, Wellbon, which is right here. Lexall, which is here. Thin set, you can see that. This is also a mastic. The Lexall, because it's clear, I use when I'm doing glass on glass. So if you're wanting to do a stained glass feel or if you're doing a votive, that's what you want to use as a clear glue. And this is great for outside too. With the liquid nails, it's sort of my, been my go-to for a long time. Um, and that's what I've been working on with this piece, with liquid nails. And the thin set, well not the thin set, but the mastic is great for kids because it's water soluble. You can also take the mastic and it looks just like 
you're going to ice a cake icing and you can tint it with acrylic paint to give it a color and that's what i did with this i took the mastic and i tinted the paint i think you guys can see it you can see it a little closer later took the mastic tinted it this blue put it on a piece of wood do not use pine i like mdf board and i also like birch but just this piece of wood and i put the mastic all over it and then i just embedded it just like i did the stepping stone and then have a nice little frame for it which is fun and as i said this is great for kids and you can buy so many things that are pre-cut for children like the nuggets or the um the, the pre-cut and tumbled glass you can find so it's not sharp or just these pieces in general so those are just the different types of glues thin set really is what you need to use outside like that micro mosaic that i just showed you how how i did that that's another good one tools of the trade these guys glass these guys tile nippers from lowe's home depot exactly what you need these are great little tools to help you move things around put put um glue on dig things up shovel things around put small doing small pieces with grout um, i've got a little sample up here so you can see all of that tweezers my best friend our tweezers well even not a toothpick an actual toothpick because i can take glue why don't we do that yeah sorry i gotta run it back and forth <laughs> there we go you can actually take the glue make sure you, yeah, you can take the glue and just put it on the end of your toothpick because some of these pieces are so small that you don't need any more than that and if you were trying to put it on with your hands it's just not going to work so a lot of times i will take the piece that i'm going to be doing i'll take this piece because it's pretty small not quite small though but i will just butter back it just put the glue on it with this toothpick and then i can set it in place where i want it to go and sometimes i have to set it in place with the tweezers because it's so small for instance so this is a piece of tom anderson's this is actually a painting and we know what a lot of paintings from the old masters look like because they were copied in a mosaic half paintings gone but the mosaic has lasted centuries so we know what the old masters were planning this is a piece that i'm doing ode to tom this is naples and you can see the tiny pieces like these are just black pieces of tile that i've nipped down nipped down nipped down and butter backed with literally a toothpick to be able to put in place so Tom probably, I think, told me that this took him about a week on and off, maybe not even that, making. I probably have at least 30 hours in this piece already. So that gives you an idea of the, of the scope and the difference. The other fun thing that you can do so you don't feel like, I can't do any of this, this is a styrofoam ball. You can take a styrofoam ball and you can take some HVAC tape. If this just pulls off. You wrap it all around it because the glue will eat the styrofoam if you don't. So you can find this at the hardware store. Or you can find this at AC Moore. And you can wrap it around it. And then you can just take the glass, the glass nuggets that you can find at AC Moore or anywhere else online. And you just glue it down. These nuggets don't look like they're touching. It looks like there's probably a lot of space in between, but there's not because you know, they're shaped like this. So the grout is going all in between these nuggets and filling it up. I probably made this 20 years ago. So they're, they're very sturdy. And basically the same thought process is involved in making this guy. This guy at the top came like this, but as opposed to having a ball, it had this same thing put HVAC around it the tape and just started gluing on the vertical surface 
things will slide. So you may want to lay it this way and let it dry a little bit and then just rotate it around to, to finish up. But you'll, you'll, you'll work with it and you'll know what you need to do. So last four minutes. Okay, at least if my watch is right. Let's talk about her. <laughs> Sort of like the elephant in the room, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I am always trying to test the bounds. And a lot of things I make, I am never going to sell. But it's just like, can I do it? Can I actually manipulate and make what I want to do work? So the shell of her literally is this. And it's plastic. It's just a plastic form like you see at the dress shops that they have clothes hanging on. So what I've done, because this isn't going to hold the weight. And that's the other big thing about mosaics. Make sure it's going to hold the weight. I actually have reinforced her on the back side with an MDF board. So I cut out MDF in her exact shape, and then I took screws and screwed it into her all the way around. And that made her so she was rigid, and she's not going to give shells are light. This is also, this is glass that I've cut, but all of these are shells and rocks and marble. And these guys are pot holders that I found at an antique store. <laughs> yes, I cheated, I didn't put these together, I didn't put all that together. But I found them like that and went, oh, I know what these would be great for later on. <laughs> these would be perfect. So when I found her, I was like, awesome, I know how I'm gonna use that. So that's, that's how I, I did her, and she is done in mastic. Now, when you get down and you start looking a little closer at her, she took a dive off the wall about three or four months ago. Um, somebody was working on the other condo wall on the other side of me, and I had her with two really big hooks, so I don't know how they hit that wall, but they hit it hard enough that she fell off, and part of her down here broke, broke, and I put it back together. She's semi put back together over here. She's not going anywhere, but she's not perfect anymore. And neither are we, right? <laughs> but she's, she's fun. And I've had a great time doing some of these. And if you go to my website, which is the Tile One On Mosaics, you will see some of the other pieces that I've done. And they have sold, and they are, they actually got bought as a set, and they are at a house in Virginia Beach um, on the water. And they were, they are very water related. And I want to leave you with a thought that no matter where you start, this was my first flower pot. It's anus. It is so bad. I have made so many mistakes on this. Everything is too far apart. I have what I refer to as um, glue boogers, <laughs> where the glue you actually see above the grout. <laughs> bad, bad, bad. But this is my first piece. But I made, I'm going to say I was about 32 years old and I am 54 now, I was 55. So it was that long ago and I've held on to her. But um, she reminds me of where I started and where I've gone to, which is um, I'm much more proud of. But she was, she was my first experiment. So I know there are questions because people were asking before. So I think we can just go ahead and open it up to questions. What kind of board did you use to apply the uh, ships? This, this is MDF board. MDF board, you can actually get it from Lowe's or Home Depot. I like to use um, quarter, I mean, well, a half inch to three fourths of an inch, depending on how much I'm gonna do. And I do, you can't see it, I have a, um, a sealant on it, but it's a real clear sealant. Um, so I, I seal all my wood before I start to glue things down on it. It's not really the glue that gets you with the wood, it's the wet grout that will get you with the wood. Wait for the mic, just so everyone can hear the question. Oh, I know that woman can project. Oh, an acrylic. Actually, I, I, I tinted the mastic. The mastic. The mastic. The mastic. They do make tint for thin set as well, but it's a commercial grade for thin set. Um, the mastic, I just use acrylic paint. Just plain old acrylic paint. 
So if you want pink, go for red. If you want, you know, you got to sort of know it's going to water down a little bit because most mastic is white. The contact paper is clear. Yes, make sure that you use clear contact paper. And I've got some up here. I can show you what it looks like. When you're using the hammer and harding, I notice you have wood under there. Um, do you absolutely need a chunk of wood like that? You, you do need a chunk of wood like that because, let me see if I can. Ah. It's anchored in. Yeah. This is the hammer and this is the hardy. Hardy. Think of like hardy board, like you might use on the side of your house, a hardy. And I know we have, a lady was asking me a question, I can't remember, there we are. That was the question. Great, great question. So same thing with vertical surfaces. You've got the same issue with the vertical surfaces on a piece of pottery. It's pretty easy. It really is. That's a piece of pottery underneath. And what you have to do is just think of the slippage. So when I'm usually doing a piece of pottery, I'll have it on um, a table with things resting around it. So I can work, rotate, work, rotate. And I've got things on both sides. So it doesn't, it doesn't slip or slide. This is a little more difficult to do it this way. This is crazy to try to do it that way. Um, but this for me, I have found, is the best technique just to set it on a table and just sort of anchor it in place and then rotate it. Would, pe would petal mosaics be made the same way? Yes, it is. Oh, and that's a good entree. So it depends on what you're going to do with the pebble mosaics. That's a pebble mosaic on, like those are rocks, big pebbles that are done on the flower pot. If you want to do one as pavement, you're going to actually use thin set. So you would, I like to make like a form. So you, it's almost like you're doing concrete work. So you're pouring concrete and then you're working in the pebbles and you've got to work fairly quickly depending on if you get quick drying concrete or not. You should use a concrete that dries fairly fast. So you've got to have a pattern, once again, in mind when you're starting to do it. But I usually try to work in chunks if I can. So I can work on a piece, work on the next piece, work on the next piece that's on the ground. You can literally do it on the ground. There is a fabulous one at Dun Dunbar Notes up in Washington, D.C. Is yeah, just, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. One other question. Uh, when did Petrodora come into this? I mean, I know it's a different, uh, you know, working in stone. Oh, the working in stone actually started before anything else. Are you talking about the stone using this way? Um, or the stone using in the floor? The stone, well, that way it's used in jewelry too. Um, that started around the 16th century. Okay. Yeah, so what you see upstairs and using more stone uh, started pretty much with the Vatican to cut it and to use it. But using it whole and more in chunks started way back. They just didn't cut it up as much. And then the Vatican in the 16th century started refining the process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have another one. Um, <laughs> you talked about the history of mosaics in Europe. Mm -hmm. Is there any mosaics in Asia or Africa? There, there are. Yeah, they are. They, they are everywhere. Sort of like almost wherever the Greeks went, wherever the Romans went, mosaics went. And you, you will see in Thailand. Um, you will see on the temples. It's a different type of mosaic. It's almost a dimensional mosaic that they are making with China. And with, um, they use a lot of China. They use a ton of pottery from plates. In um, some of the, the temples on the outside, they will make a flower. And the flower is like a, a, a ball in the middle, but they've used different shapes of flowers all the way around to make the flower, the pottery to make the shape. Uh, it's it's just exquisite, and those are all done putting on the the concrete using that. 
In the video we saw at the beginning of your presentation where we're watching the individual actually make micro mosaic, is that somebody who does that for commercial use? What was she making it for? I missed that. The, um, I think what she, you're talking about when she's melting the glass. When she's actually making that mosaic. Is that for Oh, that mosaic. Use? That probably mosaic. She probably is. It's actually for the art, um, art, art was it the mosaic art factory um, in England for the Victoria and Albert Museum. So she, they may be selling the piece. They may actually be using it as a display. And I wish they would have said the artist's name. That's one of my biggest complaints and I tried to figure out, find out who the artist is. Um, but she's, she's being hired to actually make it for a company. Speaking of, so when you get a chance, I have two of my pieces that I have bought when I was in Greece um, of the micro mosaics that you can actually touch, handle, feel, which you can't do with the ones upstairs. And um, this is the company that is still making the jewelry like this, or one of them, one of the most known. And feel free to, to look through here and you can see all the different pieces that they are making. And it's a Greek company. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i leave that sitting right here on the mermaid so you can see them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Elizabeth Locke does with her collection? Does that just rotate from one museum to another? Or? Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the plans for the collection. Um, I'm really not sure, but okay. it is privately held right now. To donate it here. Sorry? That's not something I'm aware of. Yep. That, that's possible. That'd be As sweet the MFA person, yeah. I can't deny or confirm. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I know she also has a store, a shop. I want to say it's like in Gordonsville or something like that, I, I believe, locally. Um, it's amazing collection. I think there was another question. It's going to Charleston. Is it going to Charleston? There we go. There we go. May I ask how much you pay for your Good question. Vivian, how much did I pay for the Medusa? Because she really needed to come home with me, as Vivian said. Look at her. She's calling you. Was it, was it 300? 300, I think I want to say, something like that. Um, for the Medusa, the other piece I bought several years ago, um, and I didn't pay that because they, this guy really was, I think, in her times, I think I paid maybe... 200 250 something like that so you can you can get way up there mm -hmm. did Melissa Lott do the settings of the pieces that are upstairs or is that the way they found it I think she actually did some of the settings and I think some of the settings are how she found them yeah that I did know am I right in thinking that with the micro mosaics they put the little pieces of glass upright not flat like these Correct, correct. They um, they put those straight up and down, and that it's sticking in the um, glue. You can you can take a look at one of these guys. This is the base of like a small piece of, and this is the glue. This is the putty that they put in. So you're having to make the putty as thick as this, and then you're pushing it in. Mm -hmm. Does that wax ever yellow? That they that they put on top. Did they ever cause it to yellow two times? I would think that it would. Yeah. I would think that I'm probably gonna have to re-wax mine because I wear them. I physically wear them. Um, I think if you're using it as you, a, you didn't keep it in a temperature control. Well, I think if you're using it as a decoration, it'll be fine. But I think actually personally wearing it on your body over time, I'm probably gonna have to put a wax layer on top. It's sort of like, think of it, which you might not even know this, your tile and your grout in your bathrooms. They tile it, they seal it, but you should still seal it once a year, believe it or not. You should seal your tile at least once a year to keep the mold and the mildew from getting in. I know it's crazy, and they never tell you that, but you should. Have I? No, not every two years I will. I do. I'll clean them. Yeah, I take a brush and I scrub the grout joints, and I really only seal the grout joints. I just take a literally a um, a, a paintbrush and dip it into the sealant and just go around the tiles to seal the grout. 
putty that's used in the micro mosaics, do you know how long it takes for that to dry? They have actually got a fair amount of time. I think they have. Yeah, I think they have weeks. Or you'd have to. I mean, to see, I, I would, I would assume that that piece took several weeks to do. Eight hours a day, if you could even do it eight hours a day. But it probably took several weeks to do. And and when you walk away from things like that, like with the with the pottery, with the um the clay, you can actually just put a wet cloth over it which will keep it from drying out. So you can walk away from a piece of clay like that with a wet cloth on it or with the putty to keep it lasting longer. Lorraine actually teaches mosaics. She's one of the ones that I've given up on the back of the handout on who to see for classes. Joanna is my teacher. That's right. <laughs> How to support my students. Um, Joanna is also one from Phoenix Handcraft. She also teaches mosaics in town. I don't know if anybody else is actually teaching. I usually do not have the time to teach because I'm running the Crossroads Art Center. Um, or it's running me, I'm not quite sure which way that works sometimes. Um, running ragged. Uh, but I, I do enjoy so much the, the art, the craft, and the, the class that I went to in Ravenna. If um, anybody's interested in going, maybe in February or sometime, they want to go and do it, I would love to go back and do it again. That would be fun. And the VMFA, I know, could probably help us with that as well. Um, let me think if I can think of anything else. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. So how are we going to do this? So I've got a present for somebody in the crowd. All right, so I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. So we're going to go... Um, we're gonna go this side, we're gonna go 10 rows up, and we'll go like six in. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five. At the very top. You win the stepping stone. I think that's six, is it six in? Six rows in? Six in? Oh my gosh. <laughs> there we go. So there's everything that's in there to actually make some flip-flops, make a flip-flop mosaic. You can get it at the end, and it's heavy, so it's got the ground in it, it's got this concrete in it and everything. I want to thank everybody for coming out and this is me. So our, our theme at Crossroads is art happens here. And standing where we are in the VMFA, art also happens here a lot. And we have such a treasure here. So if you have time, go back up and see the exhibit with new eyes. We're going to undo the cords so you can get over here and look at all these pieces. And I am happy to answer any more questions that you have. Happy to do that. So thank you all. Thank you.